think it's time we remind everybody. Uh, with uh, the late great Nip, long live Nip. It's like, yo, man, I want, I want you to like, 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 you know, mentor me. You know what I'm saying? Like, Nip had no ego. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's true. like Nip came to me and said, I want you to mentor me. You know, I want to get into real estate. I want, to get in, I want you to teach me all your, you know what I mean? Like your business secrets. You know what I'm saying? I was <laughs> like, whenever you got questions, pull up. And then on his last album, people do not know this. Somebody tried to jerk me, but I fixed it. I actually am one of the executive producers of Nipsey Hussle's last album. Victory Lap. Yeah, Victory Lap. So a lot of people don't know this. We got them to change it in Wikipedia. Somebody over at the label tried to leave my name out, but he came to me and said, I want you to be a part of helping me finish up this album. And so I was a part of not just the records I was on with him on his last album. He was like, yo, I'm a big fan of like life after death. You know what I'm saying? And I know you got like that vibe, but I'm bringing like. So, Diddy was not just a part of one record. I thought initially he was just a part of one record. When I first got the album, I thought he was just on Young Niggas and he had just produced Young Niggas and, you know, threw his little sprinkle along the way as far as help would be concerned right musically being naive of things right so I thought about it I said okay Lauren London's sister Miss Clark right so that would mean that there's access to Diddy in some way right that wasn't necessarily where the access came from. I was actually wrong. So, as you heard, Nipsey came to Diddy wanting help on the album, right? But how did he gain that access to Diddy? Well, we'll let Nipsey tell you. <laughs> what kind of conversations did you and Diddy have? Because you and Diddy yeah. formed a relationship. I assume through Lauren London and Cassie. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Bug threw me the. I did not like how she tried to subtly giggle right there. You and Diddy formed a relationship. You, you know. <laughs> oh, you a trouble, Lauren? No, I'm saying yeah. Lauren. Lauren introduced me to Puff. Oh, got you. Got I you. mean, I knew Puff, but. It Notice the st the subtle stutter right there in between conversation of things. Oh, Puff introduced you to Lauren? Oh, no, wait, no, he didn't. Or did he? Or did he? It was, it was more of a personal relationship after, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we was at Cassie's birthday. Stuff. At whose birthday? You heard it. We were at Cassie's birthday. They were at Cassie's birthday party. So evidently, this was still around the time that Cassie was with Diddy. We can confirm that now. Of when him and Diddy spoke. Also, this is around the time of the said freak-offs are going on. Correct? Now, how, we need to ask ourselves, how does Lauren London introduce him with Cassie and Diddy? Number two, how does one end up at Cassie's birthday party at such a prestige event, right? We're only 24 seconds in. So, I would like for you guys to understand real quick on just how close Lauren London and Cassie are. That's right. Best fucking friends. Lauren London and Cassie were besties. Or, or should I say, still are. 
But how many knew this? How many knew that Lauren London and Cassie were best friends? Some would say, oh, they just did a movie together. No, it goes beyond that. It goes far beyond them just, you know, being in a movie together. They were everywhere together. Partying together. Being at Diddy's house together. And you know what happens at Diddy's house, don't you? I mean, Cassie herself has told you what happens at Diddy's house, hasn't she? Look at Diddy's house there. Oh, look who else is at Diddy's house. And a very drunk Cassie in the middle. With Miss Lauren London on the side, huh? And if I didn't know any better, this is before these two were together. How you know? Because Nipsey is on the far left side of Lauren. And Cassie is in the middle. Quinky dink, huh? So this is obviously prior to those two dating or coming out confirming that they were dating. So now you have to ask yourselves, how exactly did Lauren London end up with Nipsey Hussle? A lot of people have already confirmed and said that they were childhood friends, that they knew each other from equal partners in LA that they were always friends. That part of the story can be true. It can be true. So let's go in further and let Nipsey finish telling you about the album. He chose young nigga. I try to get him more rap niggas mm -hmm. because oh, okay. I was I was referencing the Hate Me Now video mm -hmm. and what 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 his his presence on that record with Nas brought right. to it. I'm like, look, this this the record. This rap niggas. I want you to get on this. Put the mink on. Get in the video. We gonna make a movie. And he was like, um, he told me the whole story behind that. He like, bro, I bust a forty million dollar check a week before I did that movie. So I went. I mean, that video. Wow. So he like that's that's the energy you saw in that video. Wow. Like, I went and spent all this dough on a chain, and we got tigers. He like, because I got the biggest <laughs> check of my life. Yeah. So he like, we probably ain't going to be able to recreate that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, you know, um, when I played the rest of the songs for him, he heard Young Niggas, and he chose that record. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, he just went in the booth and then started, you take know. Take that, take that. Yeah, start gassing, <laughs> right. you know. But even still, like, Rap Niggas, he gave me some real production advice on that record. When I played it for him, it was different than what y'all heard. He said it wasn't loud enough. Right? Yeah, and he was like, listen, bro, he pulled up Natural Born Killers by Ice Cube and Dr. Dre. Mm. He's like, this is what you're going for. This is what y'all trying to do on this record. Maximize it, make it sound like this. And we went back in the studio, and I played it for my producers, and then we turned it up and added a synth lead all the way through so it sound more like West Coast violent, you know what I mean? Mm. And I, I felt what he said after the fact. I was a little upset, like, what you mean? This shit banging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but after I reapproached it, it, it was room to make the record better. See, and that's for all those people who say Diddy don't do shit. Like when they say he don't really produce. Nah, but see me, my understanding of Diddy, that's how I look at Diddy, mm -hmm. right? All right, think about my money, my problems. Mm -hmm. No disrespect to Big. Big is a legend. So what I'm about to say is not a shot against Biggie. Don't, please don't spin it like that mm -hmm. when they hear this. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that, all right, I seen an interview when Biggie had the glasses on and he was like, yeah, it's my money, my problems. You know what I mean? You got to... You just it come with this shit. That was before the record. Right. Mm. So who 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 told the songwriter, hey, look, take the Diana Ross melody and take this line, more money, more problems, and end the hook with more money, more problems. And who told who who said that? Puff. That was Puff. Right. That's production. Right. And big and then presented it to Biggie. And who said sample the Diana Ross, I'm coming out record? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Who said that? That was Puff decision. Mm -hmm. And then through Biggie to Alley Oop and Biggie came with the B I G P O. That's BPA. classic. Yeah. Uh -huh. But to catch that Alley Oop, I've been an artist. I know what that do. I gotta right. when I think, I think about 
then we should sample a big record. Then I think about what, what can I tell the songwriter for the hook. Then I gotta also do the verse. Mm -hmm. So that's what I told Puff, bro. Throw me some alley oops, like you do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Listen to what I'm saying in my interviews. Learn me. Get in your Puff Daddy the producer bag and throw me some alley oops. I'm gonna catch him. Mm -hmm. And that was like the, the original combo we had. You know what I'm saying? You sampled a uh, Hard Knock Life on the album. Yeah. So needless to say, Nipsey spent a lot of time with Diddy. A lot of time with Diddy. And it doesn't sound like. You know, this was a short period of time. We're here um, at the studio, finishing up a late night session. We want to just invite everybody to be a part of a glorious weekend because it's official. You know, my brother is putting out the album Victory Lap. Yeah, it's got All Star Weekend here in LA. Yeah, love is back. Now, just seeing that picture of Nipsey. Let's go back a little bit, right? Let's look back a little bit, right? This is a very tired, I haven't really slept much, I've barely gotten my hair done. This is a very focused Nipsey, right? But this Nipsey also tells me that he's been at Diddy's house for quite some time as well. It's got all-star weekend here in L.A. Yeah. The love is back in the air. Yeah. All that. The music is in a certain pocket. Um, I really want y'all to check out this album. You can pre-order the album right now. Right Come out now. February 16th. Puff came and really took it to the next level. Do what he do best. Arrange the team around what we had. Just like maximize it. So February 16th. Grab that motherfucker. I want, I want so you have to ask yourself. How long was he there? And why was it taking so long to actually elevate the album? Number one. Number two, what exactly did they do to elevate the album? If the album was so-called already done. That's right. The album was already done before Diddy touched it. Each other here is it's the way that I see LA. It's the, it's the new LA to me. You know what I'm saying? It's changing the narrative of going and getting that dream and, and taking control of your own destiny. That part. If you like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I see Puff is credited a lot on, on the album. Talk to me just about how that relationship came to be and manifested. Yeah, um, well, first, I co-produced that last record, too. Crazy. Oh, nice. Yeah, so, you know, I got Cut my, another I got my, check. Yeah, yeah that, part, that, that part. That part. Business. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know, Puff, I brought the, I brought the album to Puff when it, was, when it was pretty much done. Just got his feedback, played it top to bottom, just wanted to see what he thought. And he was like, it's room. It's room on these records to continue to produce. He like... You heard it. That album was already done. It was already complete and finished. Literally, one of the only things that got added to that album was the damn flute on young niggas. On rap niggas, excuse me. The flute that was added on rap niggas that was played on the keys. That wasn't even played at Diddy's house. That was the keys played by his homeboy. So it begs the question again. What exactly was even done at that at that house that had anything to do with mixing and mastering the album? You know, he, we had a good convo. He like, Nip, you know, you got you got potentially a classic album, and you know, um, it's things we could do to really push it over that 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 mm. that uh, limit. And so we just got back in the studio. He called in musicians. He called in the hitmen, his old production squad, Scott Storch. Uh, and we just vibed for like two weeks and just wow. did little touch-ups, had combos about the records, talked about if we should take any one of the songs off the album, which ones was the favorites and stuff. And then he hopped on Young Niggas. Um, yeah, so I just, I, I respect Puff as a producer, as well as all the other hats he wear. But I think one of his most valuable contributions to hip hop culture has been as a producer. Mm. Yeah. And so I wanted to I wanted to tap into that, you know, what he did for Biggie on Life After Death. Mm. Now some would also say that Puff is also an opportunist. Bad Boy Records was basically non existent at this point. Still is right now. Think about it. 
Is there an artist on Bad Boy Records right now that's selling any records? No. The only artist that is has a partnership with MMG. Or should I say used to? And that's French Montana. So this was a business move on Diddy's part. Diddy needed an artist to somewhat be on the bad boy imprint. Now, of course, Dipsy Hustle owned his own thing, so he wasn't going to be on bad boy. But what's the next best thing for Puff? Executive produced the album. Put my whole hand on this album. Boom. I still have credits because I executive produced it. The same thing I did with all the albums on Bad Boy. I executive produced them. That's how I made my money. The executive producer credit. You know what I'm saying? How cinematic he, he was able to assist those records that were street records and from a perspective of an artist that was representing the streets made something that was such a big commercial product Absolutely. without losing 1% of authenticity. Mm -hmm. I think that's genius. That's a balance not everybody can find. Right. So made I just, it a movie. A hundred percent. Made it a movie. I, I, I yeah. just want to be clear about something. He opened up the full access, all doors for you. Call the hitman. Yeah, hey, yeah. man, look. Nip I, about to roll this out. It ain't never been an artist from the West that, that got that. It, that's that, where I'm that, going. That's the convo we had, too, you know. And we ain't say that intentionally, but when I looked around and seen Mario Wine is in the building and just a ton of the dope producers, I'm like, damn, you know, you done this for, I know he, he he tapped in with Jay on American Gangster. Right. And he tapped in with Ross on Mastermind. Right. But you know, to have him involved in Victory Lap was epic. You know what I'm right. saying? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And we're gonna we gonna leak them 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 sessions later. We got videos from all the sessions. Yeah, we need all that. Yeah. We need all that. access. We was doing push-ups, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was a lot. We was keeping the end. Who who could do the most push-ups out of you or Puff? Man, I don't know. We wasn't counting. We was just, <laughs> we just going in, you know what I'm saying? Right. Just stay Jump up, up and just get right in the yeah, pool. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Again, it was clear that they spent a lot of time together. Man, you know, I came and pressed play on Puff. I let him hear the whole album top to bottom. You saw whose house that was. Not one time have they showed that they've been in a hotel somewhere, that they've been in another studio, that they've been in Nipsey's house. This entire time, We've saw this docu these these documentations and video footage. It has been at Diddy's house. Every last bit of this album in the coming day, in the last days of it, was done at Diddy's house. And of course, if this is the almost post Cassie era, one could almost know what was going on here. You know, I look at Puff like a Quincy Jones or like a um, Barry Gordy, or just hip hop. So I really felt like I did something special with the album. I ain't nothing like you fucking rap niggas. Hustle man a shooter, that's a fact, nigga. Man, you know, he just he just listened to every record. He gave me his input on what could make the records that he did comment on all the way classic and just reach their full potential. You know what I mean? It was dope to just vibe to the album top to bottom with it. It's not driven by rap ambition. It's driven by the need to express as a human, the need to like get shit off your chest and speak on life. It's reflection on a real story and the real path that, that, that I've taken and that, you know, it's unbelievable. It's a real story. My name is Nipsey Hussle. My album's dropping February 16th, 2018. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. But all of that studio footage was in bedrooms, wasn't it? It's kind of disrespectful to have a crypt and you have red. All these were at Diddy's house. A lot of drinking. All white rooms of coziness. Hmm. Makes you wonder. It really makes you wonder. 
But the other question, the other side of this coin, is Cassie in law in London? Right? Now, let's take a look deeper in the, that other side of the coin. After Nip's passing, there were rumors going around that Diddy had dated Law in London. Do you guys remember that? There were a lot, and I mean a lot, of rumors going around that Diddy and Law in London were dating because of some pictures that Diddy had posted. Hmm. Where did he get those pictures from? But let's take a trip down memory lane of those dating rumors, shall we? Hey, what's up? It's your girl, Neek, and you're tuned in to Neek at Night. And tonight I'm going to be telling you about how Miss Lauren London got little P. Diddy together with the quickness. So let's get into this. So P. Diddy, I don't know if he bored, if he ain't got nothing to do. He trying to draw up controversy because he's starting a, the new Making the Band uh, series again. I don't know what the case. But today he decided to do a post and delete and he alluded or tried to make it seem as though him and Miss Lauren had something going on. And shortly after he posted up his photos, making it seem like they had something going on, well, you know, the blogs start picking it up and start swirling dating rumors. So I'm gonna show you guys some of the things that was posted. He started off with this photo right here where it's him, it's her walking away. And you know, he kind of gazing in the background and he titled it hashtag lost files. And then he put a heart, a blue heart, and he added Lauren London. Then he had additional photos with this. And this is what the other photos look like. So he also had this where they're looking at each other. And then you see people even commented like, whoa, Nipsey's watching. And then he also had um, this. Okay, this is the same one where you can see it a little bit closer of, the, you know, her laughing and him looking or whatever. And like I said, the dating uh, sites or the blogs, I'm sorry, started to pick this up. So Media Takeout, of course, they picked this up and it said, Diddy rumored to be dating Nipsey Hussle's widow, Lauren London. So after... um they posted up that there was other people who picked it up as well this place called um sid scott ent newsfeed it says diddy rumored to be dating lauren london rumors have been flying about the relationship status of diddy and lauren london according to gossip hub media's media takeout news the nyc media mogul and widow of the late nipsey hustle are romantically linked blah 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 so blog started picking it up and so immediately lauren was like hold up pause stop and don't fucking play with me or my man so she took to her instagram and she said stop fucking playing with me and my name now let me get back to my healing so in the caption she said i'm all love and peace but never forget i'm a woman in grief and i don't play about nip my family my character and co about to drink a green juice and start the day though and then she followed that up with another post that says, um, what well, was a picture of Nipsey Hussle? And it says, still his King Ermius never forget. Now, let's think about this, though. <clears throat> Remember that post. Stop playing with my fucking name, right? Of course, everyone would assume that she had Diddy take it down. Let's get one thing clear. No one above Diddy has Diddy thinking that anyone is above Diddy. So, Diddy was not t forced by anyone to take that picture down. What Diddy did was take the picture down to save face of the truth of things. Because if things were to got a little bit sticky, which is why those pictures were even left up, that is why Diddy took them down. 
Lauren only said anything because the blogs did nothing but chew it up that she was dating someone else after Nipsey. That is the only reason Lauren had to say something. Other than that, she had said nothing to those pics. Now, let's also take a a deeper diver look, okay? Let's take a look at these pics, shall we? seen here Lauren and Diddy right but what's this hashtag lost files at Lauren London with a blue heart now one could say oh the blue heart was because it's the brother love and the sister love but no the blue heart was to symbolize Nipsey If you didn't read between the lines there. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but this doesn't look like the subtle, we just caught them off guard photos. This looks like a full on photo shoot, does it not? Why would Lauren London be doing a photo shoot with Diddy? Number one. Number two. Why did Diddy have to take them down? Number three. Why are they now lost files? Remember when we talked about earlier that Cassie and Lauren London were best friends? Could it be that Lauren London and Cassie were, you know, a part of those freak-offs together? Could it be, or should I say, that Lauren London was in some of those freak-offs with Cassie? Makes you wonder, doesn't it? if one is best friends with Cassie. Correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't there a story or allegation of Diddy smacking one of Cassie's best friends? Hmm. I wonder. Now one has to really ask the question. What's the real relationship between Diddy and Lauren London? Well, another video would make you ask the same question. Wait, I didn't even want to get dressed. I was going to wear sweats. And, Did you, uh, were you really? <laughs> Did somebody, like, I'm not getting, yeah. did somebody pull you aside? Somebody pulled me aside. Um, Puff. Really? Puff pulled me aside and was like, look, bud. Who? Now, if you also didn't catch that, look, bug was something Nipsey used to say to her. Bug is something her close, close people say to her. Bug has always been her nickname from the neighborhood. How does Diddy know that? Number one. Number two. Out of all of the people, and I mean all of the people, you were about to wear sweats to your late husband's funeral. That's another thing. You're about to wear sweatpants to your late husband's funeral. That's the thing. Just to show how... Now, uh, some people could say, oh, she just was in grieving. That's a lack of care. Okay? 
Call a spade a fucking spade. That is a lack of care if you were planning to wear sweats and you didn't care to go to that funeral. You knew that that funeral was going to be at the Staples Center, I believe. A huge venue at that. But you didn't care and you were going to wear sweats? Okay, you're grieving in depression. Okay, let's put that factor in it. But let's put this other factor in it. Why is Diddy the main person that consoled you and told you not to wear sweats? You mean to tell me Lala, Black Sam, Sam, Nipsey Hussle's brother that is close to you? Uncle to your kids. He didn't tell you not to wear sweats? But no. Of all the names you could have named, Diddy was the one that told you to not wear sweats. Huh. Again, we have to ask. How does Diddy have access to Lauren London? You have showed everybody what it looks like to hold a man down and to love him. Now show them what it looks like when it all crumbles. That's your responsibility. I hope he doesn't mind me sharing that. But Puff was more, you know. Now, why would he mind you sharing that? Especially the way that you said it just now. That's your responsibility. To hold him down in death right now. That's The way she emphasized that and then followed it up with, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing that. He's like a real brother. Mm -hmm. He's yeah. been through a lot of loss too. Right? Mm -hmm. So he was like, you get, you know, you, you show up. Angie saved her ass with, with he's been through a lot of loss. Because the first thing that came out her mouth was Diddy is like a brother. Because he heard, I guess, I don't know who told Puff. I was Somebody call respect. Puff. Somebody, Somebody call Puff. Puff. Again, how does he have so much access to her? So this wasn't a, I just saw her or she happened to call me or someone said something. This was someone told Puff and Diddy got access to her to tell her not to wear sweats. Somebody in your family Somebody or your call team Puff. called Puff like, you talk to Lauren. Because I was like, I'm wearing whatever. Mm. Now, again, Angie even made it worse just now, kind of. How does Diddy get the word to say, yeah, you be the one to talk to Lauren? I'm not supposed to this time. You know, I was like giving that. And so he was like, no, show, show up. Show up with your head up. So I show up with your head up really think god just carried me through that because i don't know how wait i didn't even want to get dressed as they say the eyes are also the window to the soul I don't know, y'all. You guys tell me. Again, another picture from Diddy's house. Questions have to be asked. Because then how does one do a photo shoot with this? Matching jackets, even. All three matching jackets. Lauren was definitely closer to Diddy than she wants to lead on. That part is becoming extremely evident. Seen again here at the launch.
again together all three look where Lauren is Now here's where things get tricky. Who's that? Now, let's break down this picture a little bit. Matching teal. Okay. The hand is beside both of them. We know Cassie is definitely not with him. And we know who Lauren London is supposed to be with at this time. Or possibly with. Or she could be with no one at this time. Right? So, begs the question. Because if Lauren London was with no one before Nipsey, who is this? Remember the allegations of the male sex workers from Cassie? That's right. This, ladies and gentlemen, is one of those male sex workers. That just happened to be out at the, in the nighttime with them. As you can see, this night was about to come to an end, with him still being there. And we know who else is there. We know who else is also there. That's right. You have to ask yourself the question. How does that happen? A few people that I've analyzed this picture with have all said the same thing in the very beginning of, th of the looking at this picture from first glance. How is it that Lauren London and Nipsey Hussle are in a couple at this time, but Diddy is in the middle of the picture? As if he... I don't know, barged his way in? Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Let me get in this picture right here. But even if you do, you stand on the side of Nipsey. You don't move Nipsey out the way and put your arm around Lauren. As if Lauren's yours. Are we following here? And Nipsey just looks the most uncomfortable of faces in his in, in this picture. This is probably the most uncomfortable I've ever seen Nipsey be in a picture. Face-wise. Lauren, of course, taking the picture, it, you can see in her face. I'm not going to say anything. I'll say it to you after. But you shouldn't have barged in. There is not a single smile here in this picture. Let's also be clear. There is not a smile in this picture. So after all the further details we have gone con conclusion to, one has to ask the question, what is the real relationship between Diddy and Lauren London. Further, what's the real relationship between the three of them? Hmm. Was there a business arrangement made? I wonder. With this picture being taken, and if I had to take, I don't know, using 
the heads going up, right? I would want to think that Nipsey, God rest his soul, was not necessarily in a freak off, but in a situation to where he would need to get something from Diddy. Right? Are we following along here? Diddy, the opportunist he is, you heard it. He called in all the big guns, right? He called in all the big guns for Victory Lap. Why did he do that? Why would he do that? Better question. What would be Diddy's incentive for doing it? You go down further to the left of the picture. Because it's not just the executive producing of it. If that is the case, Diddy would not have put those pictures out after Nipsey passed. Let's be clear. Those pictures were posted Lost Files, hashtag Lauren London, Blue Heart, after Nipsey passed. Subliminally in all white but in black and white tone. Very spooky. Very spooky. Because I know what a lot of you are thinking. What if one and two equal three? Right? What if one and two equal three? It didn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. Because then you have to ask yourself, well, what's in it for Nipsey? What is in it for Nipsey? Nipsey wanted to, of course, as he's always said, better the community. He's always wanted to just simply better the community. And did he promise him that he could do that? Not just with the production of the album, but a lot of people don't know that Revolt TV had a bigger hand in the marathon clothing picking up the way it did. All right, welcome back everybody to Successful Ladies Live. And I really am kind of starting to feel sorry for Snoop because I can see that Jay-Z and P. Diddy are running things. And although knowing to the fact that if they didn't own their own business, they would be a worker bee like everyone else. So the easiest way to keep the masses under control is to constantly tell the masses that someone else controls their destiny. 90 plus percent of millionaires puffy Let's go. Let's go further into the revolt situation, right? Watch this. Ownership. So that's really what excites me to see the new talent. I, I look at people that are coming in to learn. I'm looking at them as new talent. I used to be looking for the next Biggie, the next Mary J. Blige. You know what I'm saying? I'm looking for the next Puff. I'm looking for that next executive, that next manager, that next creator. Notice that all of the titles that he used are people that work for someone else. 
He said he's looking for the next Puffy, but he's not looking for the next Puffy because the next Puffy would be in direct competition with him. P. Diddy has always made his money pillaging other people's talents. He's never there to train you to become himself. A future entrepreneur, at and and Revolt would like to invite you to the meeting, the Revolt Summit, happening in Atlanta, in LA. I want to see y'all there. So let me show you guys what I'm talking about. Exhibit A. For GA pricing, it's $199.50. For VIP pricing, it was $649.50. To actually attend the event, where he said he was looking for the next manager, the next executive. He didn't even give bullet points to tell you guys what you were going to get at this event. Of course not. Because the whole thing was to sell, 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 sell. Similar to this one. Nipsey scam definitely has a 100 or 300 percent return on. I need to go back just a little bit. But all this stuff becomes a scam. So I remember this commercial. Nip could have taken his money and opened up a store anywhere. I remember this little commercial because they literally, if you watched Revolt TV at the time, they literally aired this shit every, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Every three or four videos or every single commercial break, you literally saw this ad every single hour of the fucking day. Let me just say on behalf of the city of Los Angeles, this is the biggest grand opening of any business anywhere in Southern California today. So now as this rabbit hole gets deeper and deeper, we start to see who the key players are in keeping the most impoverished black people at the bottom, reaching for their goal at the top. The Tupac scam clearly did not work, but the Nipsey scam definitely has a 100 or 300% return on their investments. In this picture right here, you have Nipsey Hussle with Idris Sandu, the gentleman in the black shirt, all black shirt, that actually helped him to get the geofencing technology available and put into the products that he had at the Marathon Clothing Store. Now, it's my thoughts that Nipsey actually uh, brokered this deal with Idris Sandu all on his own. And when Jay-Z and Rock Nation, everybody found out about the geofencing technology, they wanted to silence and keep Nipsey from being able to go forward with this idea for years to come. So they invested in his Marathon clothing store, helped him to relaunch the clothing store, which is exactly what you're gonna see in this video. It wasn't a launch, it was a relaunch. The clothing store already existed right there at that corner lot. And so the scam began. Nipsey wanting to have a better life, wanting to go ahead and get his business to the next level. He had always talked about the shootings in the parking lots and the poverty. Thought that this would be a great idea to partner with Rock Nation and Jay-Z and all these cronies. When really in the end, all they wanted to do was steal his ideas. This was always one of our dreams was to be able to like come inside in this parking lot. We was always outside hustling in the, in the actual lot. And we just kind of just being here for so long, realized that it would make sense to be owners or, you know, have businesses in this parking lot. It was a important intersection. There was a lot of commerce going on. And it made sense like then if we can actually get in here, we'll be able to really elevate what we're trying to do. We saw what's going on on Fairfax, what's going on on Melrose and Soho and in Japan with their boutiques and just with the shopping experience and the stores and how it adds value to the actual brand. And so we wanted to do something like that in our own space though. 
Now, for those of you that are new to my platform, this is not about the corner lot. It's not about the clothing. It was actually about the geofencing of the technology that Nipsey was getting a hold of with Idris Sandu and being able to actually corner the market on being able to sell your mixtapes or your albums through your clothing brand and through other avenues that didn't entail your titles, your revolts. And he was coming into direct competition against Jay-Z and P. Diddy when it came to the record label and the streaming services that they pretty much wanted to be a conglomerate in. And they wasn't trying to have that. So now you hear not only the real reason that Diddy and Nipsey even had business. Number one. Number two, the album was the front for Marathon Clothing. Marathon Clothing was the front for Vector 90. The fencing that she's talking about. There was... And I didn't even realize how much Jay-Z had to play, not Jay-Z, but Rock Nation. Let me also say that. people, We're going to get d deep dive into that one day. Because I don't know if y'all notice how much people keep trying to separate Jay-Z and Rock Nation. But... Nipsey was trying to better the community. And he was trying to do it without the powers that be stopping him from doing it his way. And the powers that be had a more corrupt, schemy way of doing things to where they were just going to make money and keep the hood the same way it was. They had no intention on bettering the hood. They had no intention whatsoever on bettering the hood whatsoever. Unfortunately. And to confirm things, I would like for you guys to listen to a young lady by the name of Sloan Bella. Uh, Sloan Bella actually had predicted the Cassie situation. So five months ago, she had predicted on the exact date that Cassie was going to file a lawsuit. She didn't say specifically that she was going to file a lawsuit. She just said that something was going to happen to Diddy and pertain to her channeling Kim Porter. If you want to look up Sloan Bella channels Kim Porter and you take a listen to yourself but she had channeled Kim Porter and Kim was able to give her some information she channeled she channels different people but I want you guys to listen to what she says about Nipsey Hi everyone, I'm Sloan from SloanBella.com and I'm back with another channeled celebrity video. This one is on the late West Coast rapper Nipsey Hussle, who was gunned down outside of his work on his way to or from an event, I forget what it is. And to tell you the truth, I knew nothing about this man until I heard about it on the radio. Nothing. So when I started to channel his energy, which started yesterday and I'm doing the video today, it hadn't occurred to me to do a video on him because I don't really know much about it and it's not really my thing. Having said that, I was immediately shown that he and I share the same birthday. We are both August 15th Leos. Leo Sun, Leo Moon, and his rising was in Pisces. Obviously, he's younger, born in 1985. So Nipsey Hussle was a rapper that came up from South Central and basically made it big in the rap community. Although I'll be honest again, I never heard about him. So it must've been something that, um, it wasn't like a Tupac thing for me where I knew who Tupac was. I did not know who this man was or much about him. So he was elevated really quickly and then his passing happened just as quickly. But it's interesting because as I'm pulling in on his energy, he is showing me karmically many lifetimes, three, I'm seeing at least three of the most recent past lifetimes 
where he was born into bodies that would express entertainment urges or or entertaining urges at the beginning real quick i want you guys to also note what she said just now he was and she had no idea who he was but getting he was elevated quickly and then he passed quickly so she had no idea who nipsey hustle was before she channeled his energy as a psychic but she emphasized he was raised up quickly and he was out of here quickly notice how he said that and what we just went over on how diddy basically came in not only sprinkled what he did with the album executive producing the album and making the album victory lap bigger but then rock nation and bad boy and revolt come excuse me not bad boy but revolt tv and rock nation come along and now make marathon clothing bigger so now Nipsey Hussle brand becomes bigger. Him himself becomes bigger, right? Right before he passes. Just enough to capitalize off of his passing. Of an entertainment arc. He's showing me this for a reason. So he's basically saying in his last most recent incarnation, he came in, let's say it was in the 1900s. I don't really know when it was, but he's kind of giving me a vaudevillian feel to it which if you know anything about it, it's the early kind of song and dance men type of thing. He's giving me a feel that he really was familiar with that type of lifestyle and that every time he was born, he came in at the beginning of an entertainment trend. And so by the time he mastered the trend, it was too late for him to achieve the kind of acclimate that he wanted. This life was different. He came into it and he's showing me that he was dropped into it. Now, I know that everybody who knows him or is familiar with his work is going to say that this, this kid wanted to be a rapper, this is what he did, but I don't actually feel that. I feel like he was chosen for a reason and I don't mean in a past life. I feel like he was elevated in this life. What I'm seeing is kind of a backroom broker deal happening with him and his career, okay? The first thing, the first words he says to me when I'm asking him to come through or the energy around him, it's not always them I'm talking to, although I do feel like he's around. A lot of times it's their guides that bring the information through and bring me the knowledge that I need to at least get a conversation going. It's not always the dead person. There's a mistake when we're talking about channeling with that. So I'm not really sure where it's coming from because I'm not seeing, I'm hearing. But when I'm hearing the information around him, he's kind of showing me how he was dropped into this, this, this life that he did. And there was a lot of discord at the end of his life. And I'm not talking with the idiot that murdered him. I'm talking about with family members. There was a rift with his family. So when you see the footage of his family, and I'm sure they're deeply saddened, I don't mean it quite like that, but he's showing me that there was a rift and that he wasn't seeing things clearly. And sometimes you're born into a pack of people that aren't all your people. This is what he's showing me. There was a feeling of discontent between those people in his immediate environment, which I take also to mean family members. And he's showing me a knife in the back. So somebody that he considered to be a family member or a close knit like family member, female, and I'm not saying his girlfriend does not feel like his girlfriend, put a knife in his back is what he's saying to me. Now, obviously the person who murdered him is responsible. That's the person who murdered him. However, he's telling me it's like a board game is what he's showing me. Again, with the board games, this is the reference that I get all the time Some with these people. They show me board games. I must have that kind of mind where I want to play like uh, checkers or something. But he's showing me a board game like it was one move, next move, one move, next move, and he didn't stay up on his moves. So he was kind of expecting this to happen. He just didn't think it would happen when it happened. Now, what he is showing me is you've got to be careful. I have so much to tell you is what I'm hearing in my head as if I'm him, not me. He has so much to say, he has so much to say about what he did and what he realizes and what he thought and where he got himself into before he could get himself out and the backstabbers around him. There were several different things going on. His name was being used and is still being used to elevate a cause in order for other people to gain money. And I'm not talking about his music. Hear that? Did you fucking hear that? Sloan Bella doesn't know Nipsey Hussle from a fucking hole in the wall. 
So she has no idea what we just looked at with the whole marathon clothing scam, with Revolt TV getting involved, with Rock Nation being involved. She has no idea about any of that. So for her to channel the energy and to gather that exact information, that there was somebody that was scheming behind him to elevate him and put him on a pedestal before killing him, yeah. He's kind of laughing at the music and don't get mad at me and send me the hate emails, but he's kind of laughing at me like, I really was kind of mediocre at the music is what he himself is saying. He was trying to master it and he did the best he could, but he had this brain where he wanted to be known for other things on an intellectual level, not so much like um, rapping was the only way that he knew of how to get some credibility as a person in the black community, which is really interesting. As a whole group of people in our society, Black people have been pitted against everybody else and all of society, whether we like it or not, come from other countries or familiar with slavery, not familiar with it from our countries. We have a viewpoint of people of color and he's kind of showing me, like he's very uh, social in his activism with this, saying that that's a setup, it's a setup. And that's what he was trying to say. This shit is a setup. Now, when he went back to his community in South Central to give back to the kids, that was intentional and that was from the heart. His heart was open that way. Of course, he's a double Leo, so yeah, Leo rules the heart chakra, so it has to be open. And when it's not open, that's when a Leo gets depressed. They become sad. So if a Leo is not allowed to express themselves in a heart-centered way, they shut down on an emotional level. So this man was trying to give back to his community because he really felt that he owed them something, not because of his skin color, but because of his past behavior. He is saying, that I'm hearing, okay, from whoever, about him because that's how I hook in. Again, could be a guide, could be him. But I am hearing that he was trying to make up a tone for what he had done growing up. And I mean, he was kind of a funny, quirky kid. He had a persona one way, but he really wasn't that way. He had a 10. So we don't need to get into that, of course, because she's going to get into the deeper part of who Nipsey Hussle was, which, like I said before, Ironic how she knew all of that. She knew all that. Without even knowing who Nipsey Hussle was. Yeah, man. You got you to ask yourself. She didn't know Nipsey Hussle from a hole in the wall, bruh. Psychic. Was able to channel in his energy and pulled in that exact information. So think about that, y'all. Didn't know Nipsey from nowhere. Said, yo, it was some people that was scheming behind his back. And that's why he ended up dying. Because those people were trying to, those people elevated him and then took him out of here. And he didn't stay up on his moves. He knew that it was going to happen, but he didn't know when. And he didn't know how. Some things are not coincidence, man. And it just so happens that another body ends up at the hands of the executive producer of this album. So if you wanted to ask yourself ever, well, damn, who would have wanted... Anyway, 